Good morning, Redemption. Uh, We're here because Jesus draws us to himself. For all that we've lost and missed uh, in the course of this season, we can still worship. Um, We can do that because of who Jesus is. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way into peace. Jesus is the way of justice. Jesus draws us to the way of healing. It is Jesus' goodness that does all this. So let's follow him. Let's worship him this morning. Lost at the fall, running away when that he called. Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own, I had no right to draw near your throne. Father, you loved me still. I didn't love before you laid the foundations you predestined to adopt me as your own you have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cost. Jesus, your face was set. I worked my fingers down to the bone. Nothing I did could ever atone. Jesus, you paid my debt. By your blood, Redemption and salvation. Don't you die that I might reap what you have sown. And you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night Spirit, you made me see I swore I knew the way on my own Hit full of rocks and heart made of stone Spirit, you moved in me At your touch, my sleeping spirit was awake To a kingdom that cannot be shaken Heaven sent us and by grace and grace alone So I stand in faith by grace and grace alone I will run my race by grace and grace alone I will slay my sin by grace and grace Redemption Tempe. I am recording this video uh, up in Flagstaff trying to get, you know, um, a day of Sabbath in the midst of this crazy season. And I just wanted to give you a quick update. As you know, last week Josh mentioned that we were planning some outdoor gatherings, and I wanted to let you know where we're at with our regathering process. 
Well, first of all, we recognize that we're in the middle of a spike and this is actually something we anticipated. We actually had a, a strong feeling that it might go this direction. And so instead of assuming the best case scenario, we've been planning for the worst case scenario and really designing something that could be uh, the safest possible way for us to have our initial gatherings together. And so what that's gonna look like is it's gonna be an outdoor gathering uh, where we're gonna focus on prayer and worship, and we're gonna have a number of things in place uh, to keep make sure people have a lot of distance. We'll be on the football field, so if you need 40 feet of distance, we're gonna make sure you can get it. Um, but that's what we're planning on right now. We currently do not have a date set. Uh, Warren and I uh, will be speaking next week and we'll be talking about some very important things in the life of our church. We're going to be drawing one of the most important pictures we've ever drawn and we're going to be talking a little bit about our philosophy for reopening and how we're thinking about all of that. Now one thing I will say is that uh, we're, we're currently solidifying things as we talk to our uh, COVID advisory board, which is made up of people who are a part of our church, who are medical professionals, who uh, pe people who are focused on modeling, who are real experts in this field. And so we still need to have some further conversations with them before we solidify things. But Warren and I will give you more details next week. Uh, if there's any Sunday to lock in, it will be next Sunday. And I wanna leave with this. You guys have been resilient and you have been uh, incredible in the way that you have loved others during this season. And I want to encourage you to not grow weary in doing good. And as I was sitting here praying for you, 1 Corinthians 15 came to mind where Paul calls the Corinthian church to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And the good that you are doing, the way that you are serving your neighbor's redemption is not in vain. And so we look forward to connecting with you next week as Warren and I give some important information. And with that said, let me pray uh, for us and for uh, our state and everything that's going on. Father, I sit here in the middle of this forest and recognize that you are the God of creation. You are a good God. And we also recognize that there is something distorted about your creation on a microbiological level right now. And we pray that you would bless doctors and nurses and uh, public servants and um, all of the people who are doing the microbiological warfare to subdue uh, this invisible enemy of ours. We pray that you would make them effective and God, we pray that you would fill us with both courage and wisdom and clear eyes on how to love our neighbors in the midst of this time. We pray uh, that our, our state would flourish and that your hand of protection would be extended to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 23, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. He obeys me, pastor. Nada me faltará. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. Me pastoreará. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Even though I walk through the valley. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. No temeré mal alguno. I will fear no evil. 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 Porque tú estarás conmigo. For you are with me. You are with me. For you are with me with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Me seguirán todos los días de mi vida. Todos los días de mi vida. And I shall dwell. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord 
forever. Forever. Por largos días. Por largos días. Forever. This is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I was 16 years old, and I was new at driving. And I had driven to Subway to get something to eat. And as I got back in my car with my sub sandwich, I began to pull out of the parking space. And I made the honest mistake of pulling out in front of someone else. But the person I pulled out in front of completely flipped out and then, of course, flipped off. And then they began to chase me. See, this was my first experience with road rage, and I was just 16 years old. And I remember the moment very vividly because I was scared. See, I knew I was being chased, but I had absolutely no idea how this would end. Luckily, in high school, I had seen a few different Fast and Furious movies, and so I was ready to go. I had my 1990 Honda Civic. It was like driving a go-kart, and so I was ready. But the reality was, fight or flight kicked in. My, my adrenaline was rushing. And I pulled out of the parking lot and the car followed me and I was weaving in and out of traffic and I was making quick turns to try to get away. But what I knew was coming up down the road, there was a Fry's grocery store with usually a busy parking lot. And so I whipped into the parking lot. I'm driving fast like crazy through the parking lot and I ended up going up one of the down aisles. And I was able to make a maneuver with my car where the other car kind of got trapped and I was able to lose him. And I pulled back out on the main road and I thought that they were gone. And I kept looking in the rearview mirror as I headed home. I drove for home. And as I watched in the rearview mirror, it looked like I lost them and I would be safe. See, the reality is when you are being chased, whether it's by road rage, a, a dog, or someone else, you feel fear and anxiety because you have no idea how the chase is going to end. And in reality, it could be a life or death situation. See, but this morning, David is going to tell us about a chase that is happening. And it's a chase that brings great comfort and assurance because we know how the chase is going to end. And so this morning, we're going to pick up in Psalm 23, verse 6, as we conclude our Psalm 23 series. Follow along with me. Verse 6, David writes, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We are being chased because the goodness and mercy of God pursue us. See, David says that goodness and mercy shall follow me. And in Hebrew, that word for follow me is actually an active word, and it's better translated, pursue me or chase me. And some translations actually have it in the, in the Bible translation to say, follow, instead of follow me, to pursue me. See, what David is saying is that goodness and mercy will chase him all throughout his life. So if you know anything about shepherds, when shepherds have a large flock of sheep to care for and shepherd, they need help. They can't do it on their own. And so they rely on something else. They rely on sheep dogs. Some of you may actually have sheep herding dogs at home as pets. But what the, the role of sheep dogs in shepherding is they help the shepherd to care for the flock, to guard the flock, to guide the flock, to go after the sheep that wander. And what David is saying is that our shepherd has two sheep dogs, and these sheep dogs are goodness and mercy, and they help to shepherd the flock. See, because there's something that David knows about sheep. He knows that sheep are prone to wander. See, Isaiah writes in Isaiah 53, verse 6, he says that we're all like sheep who have gone astray. See, sheep are creatures of habit. And they have the habit of wandering, and many times even wandering to their own detriment. 
So David says these sheepdogs of goodness and mercy pursue these sheep that are so prone to wander. And when they pursue them, they bring them back home to the flock. And this is for the purpose of protecting the sheep. It's for their own protection. It's for their own good. It's for their own flourishing. But for us, for you and I this morning, if we are honest, when we are on the shepherd's path, there are many other paths that look far more appealing. When we are in the green pasture that the shepherd has us in, there are other pastures that look far more appealing, that look greener than the pasture that we're currently in. And these are idols that we run after, things that have captivated our hearts and our affections, things that we're bowing down to instead of our shepherd. These are things that we give our allegiance to instead of our shepherd. It's things like consumerism and stuff. It's things like pleasure and sex. It's things like comfort and a life of ease and entertainment. Or it's the reality that we're tempted to follow the way of the elephant or the way of the donkey when Jesus calls us to follow the way of the lamb. So the question I have for you this morning is what are the things that are enticing you to wander away from your shepherd? See, there's sheepdogs that are chasing you right now this morning and they're inviting you to come back to your shepherd. See, there's something else that David knows about sheep. He knows that wandering sheep is a life or death situation. This is exactly why The sheepdog chase is so vitally important because on every other path besides the shepherd's path, there are cliffs and it is dangerous. And sheep, when they're left to their own devices, when they're left to wander on their own, will wander right off of a cliff to their own destruction. See, this actually happened in Turkey a few years ago in a small Turkish village, a shepherding village. It's known as a mass jump. There were 400 sheep that wandered and ended up jumping off of a cliff to their own death and destruction. And how this happened, there was one sheep who wandered. And the sheep wandered all the way off of the cliff. It was about a 50 foot tall cliff and the sheep wandered to his death and 399 sheep followed one by one and they all walked right off of the cliff. And they all died to the horror of the villagers in Turkey. See, Jesus knows that wandering sheep is a life or death situation. And in Luke 15, Jesus tells a parable, a parable about a lost sheep, a sheep that has wandered. And this is why in Luke 15, our good shepherd leaves the 99 to pursue the one that has wandered and then rejoices when the one who has wandered comes back because Jesus knows wandering is a life or death situation. And what Jesus wants desperately, what he desires for us as his sheep is that we would live with him, is that we would experience life. And when we wander to things that look more enticing and appealing, he is faithful and he pursues us by his mercy and by his goodness to draw us back so that we can come home. See, and this is what David knows to be true about God. David knows that goodness and mercy are not just merely two sheepdogs that the shepherd uses. See, goodness and mercy is who he is. It's who the shepherd is, that goodness and mercy make up who God is. It's a part of the very essence of his character. And we see this in God's very self-revelation. In Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, the same Hebrew word is used in Exodus 34 as it is in Psalm 23, verse 6. And this is where God reveals who he is to his people. In Exodus 34, he says, The Lord, the Lord, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. See, David wants us to know that this is who God is, that this is what our shepherd is like, and that this is who is chasing us throughout our lives. But David also 
now tells us how this chase will end. See, there's no place like home. And as I say that, some of you may scoff and say, John, are you kidding me? I've been quarantined, stuck in my house for the last three months. You're telling me there's no place like home. I want to get out of my house. And I get that. But we have a deeper and better home in the house of the Lord, and our shepherd has enabled us to become residents in his house. See, David says that he will dwell in the house of the Lord. But what is the house of the Lord that he's talking about? See, the house of the Lord is the temple. But the interesting thing about the temple is that no one lived there. But the temple is the the very place where God made his presence known to people, and people could come in and experience his presence. And so what David is telling us here, he's saying that he will live in the very presence of the Lord, and that this will be his home. See, but for us, We look forward to living in the house of the Lord forever. When we will get to dwell in the house of the Lord in the new heavens and new earth. When Jesus returns to make all things new and his kingdom is fully realized on earth as it is in heaven, we will get to dwell in his kingdom with the king. See, this will be our home and this is our future hope. But David tells us here in verse 6, that he lives as a resident in the house of the Lord. See, it's important when we read verse 6 here that it's connected to verse 5. Because what happens in verse 5 is we see this metaphor throughout Psalm 23 change. And it becomes, going from the, the shepherding metaphor, now becomes a host. The shepherd becomes a host, as Josh preached on last week, There's a table that's prepared before David. There's a feast. And now God is personified as a host. And it's important that we understand what eating a meal with someone meant in the Old Testament ancient world. Because it meant something different than it means today. See, when you ate with someone during that time, it signified the creation of a deep bond of loyalty with the person you ate with. It implied that you were entering into deep relationship with the person that you were eating with. And so David is not merely an acquaintance who's invited over for a quick meal. That's not what we see. We see that he's a meal guest in verse 5, but now here in verse 6 that we're looking at this morning, David now becomes part of the family. This is family imagery. See, David doesn't come over for a three-hour meal and then leave. David is invited to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He's not leaving the house. See, we are not guests. We are residents. And there's no place like home. See, there's things that you do in the comfort of your home that you don't do when you're a guest somewhere. You don't raid someone's pantry when you're a guest. You probably don't shower with the door open when you're a guest. You don't put your shoes on someone's sofa when you're a guest. And if you have kids, you don't let your kids run around and destroy someone's house and make messes when you're a guest. But you can do those things in the comfort of your home because there's no place like home. Or if you're going on vacation and you find an Airbnb online, You find a beautiful, amazing Airbnb that is modern and it's swanky and it's so much better than the house you actually live in and you go on vacation and you stay in the Airbnb, but after a few days you begin to miss home because there's no place like home. See, what David wants us to realize is that once you experience living in the house of the Lord, you actually realize that there is no place like home. That there is nothing else in all of the world that can satisfy you in the way that living in the very presence of God satisfies. That there is no amount of sex or money. That there is no dream job. That there's no relationship. That there is no amount of material possessions. That there is no one political candidate. That there's no amount of freedom or autonomy that will ever satisfy you 
like dwelling in the house of the Lord. See, this is what the prodigal son realized when he left his father's house looking for things that would satisfy and he squandered his inheritance money. He realized that there was no place like home. And so he came back to his father's house. This is why in Psalm 16, the psalmist can write, Lord, in your presence is the fullness of joy. But what we've said is the house of the Lord, nobody lived there, but in this context, it is the temple where the very presence of God dwelled. And so we could say, Lord, in your house is the fullness of joy because that's where your presence is. See, David knows exactly how this shepherd chase ends. And it ends in the comfort of a home. See, it's like when I pulled onto the driveway of my house after experiencing my first experience of road rage and I came home, I felt comfort of being home. As I looked in the rearview mirror and I realized that no one had followed me home, I had certainty and assurance that I would be okay. See, David has certainty. And David has assurance that he will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He's so certain that he even writes in verse 6, he doesn't say, I might dwell in the house of the Lord. He says, I will dwell. And that's because his certainty rests on God. That he knows that this sheepdog chase, these sheepdogs of goodness and mercy that are pursuing him all throughout his life will end. This chase will end with him living in God's presence forever. He knows that this faithful God will bring him to his house. And David will live at home as a resident for the rest of his life. See, David was not at all certain in his ability as a sheep. He knows that when he wandered, he could never find his way home apart from his faithful shepherd who who pursued him. But all of David's certainty rested on one thing. It rested on God, who was his faithful shepherd, because all throughout David's entire life, he experienced the faithfulness of God, that he knew that God was constantly pursuing him, that God was constantly protecting him, that God was constantly providing for him and that God was constantly present with him. We see this throughout the entirety of Psalm 23 as we've looked at it. See, we can have this same comfort and we can have this same certainty that we will dwell in the house of the Lord that David had. But I know that some of you this morning are watching and you don't feel the comfort, and you don't feel the certainty that David had. Because some of you are feeling weary. And maybe this has been a season where you've been searching for greener pastures, but all you're finding is dry grass and cliffs. Some of you are exhausted, and some of you are maybe even confused because you've been wandering and you don't even actually know where home is anymore. Or some of you during this strange season that we're living in feel alone and you feel abandoned and you're wondering where is this faithful pursuing shepherd in my life? See, if that's you this morning, there's good news for you. There's good news for you and there's good news for all of us this morning because there's an invitation. There's an invitation for us to have comfort and there's an invitation for us to have certainty because it rests on one thing. It rests on one person, Jesus. See, we can have comfort and we can have certainty that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because of Jesus. Because Jesus embodies the goodness and mercy of God as he made it visible to the world. Because Jesus is the good shepherd who pursues the wandering sheep and he will leave the 99 to go after the one to bring us home. Because Jesus enables us to enter into the presence of God because he is the lamb that was slain and he washes us and he makes us pure. Because Jesus allows us to live in his house as family because we are adopted as sons and daughters of God and we become part of the family. 
Because Jesus will return. And when he returns, he's going to build his house on earth as it is in heaven, and we will live with him, and we will eat with him at his table. See, Jesus is our comfort, Jesus is our certainty, and Jesus is our shepherd. And so this morning, as we close, I want to invite you to celebrate Jesus as we take communion. If you have the elements at home The bread represents Christ's body that was freely given for us. And the wine or the juice represents Christ's blood that was shed for us. And we get to celebrate our good shepherd who became the lamb that was slain. And it's by his blood that we're united to him. And we can live with him in his house forever. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are the one who pursues us. That you are the good shepherd. Lord, we are realize and we acknowledge that we wander, Lord, that we have desires, that there are things that entice us to wander from you to seemingly greener pastures. And Lord, I pray that by the power of your spirit, you would enable us to push against those things that are enticing us, to resist those things, Lord, that we could faithfully follow you, our shepherd, because that is where life is. And so, Jesus, I pray for those who are hurting this morning, for those who are suffering, for those who don't feel comfort, that your very presence would meet them in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their, um, in the midst of their loneliness and isolation and whatever they may be feeling, that you would minister to them by the power of your Spirit. So, Jesus, we celebrate you. We celebrate the reality that we know that we will live with you forever. It's in your holy, precious, and powerful name we pray. Amen.
every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace strings of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song sung by flaming tongues above praise a mountain fixed upon it mount of Let's remember that we have Christ as our shepherd and take comfort in the fact that his mercy and his love pursues us in every moment and will continue to pursue us every day of our lives. Amen.